I can't claim to be an expert in the matter, but in my personal opinion, a DM player character is only good if it's either weaker than the rest of the party or filling in on a role they wouldn't otherwise have, such as a heel bot, and is either there entirely because the party wants it to be or has a fluff ties with one or more of the PCs, like a sister or whatever. Those that force themselves to the group without the party's consent and are stronger than them to steal the spotlight are pretty bad, right? Or is it that no DM player character is ever good? I don't know, this is just an excuse to tell you a story about a DM player character anyway. The game is Advanced D&D, 2nd edition. We had a bunch of players, everyone created characters, the game was set, when we noticed there was a thief missing. A thief is missing in Advanced D&D, 2nd edition, and you might as well call it quits there, because you're dead. The DM shrugged and said, okay, I'll figure something out. So beginneth the game. We began with the second of the two most classic scenarios to start an RPG in, Imprisoned. The party, along with a bunch of other unfortunate folk, have been caught by a group of gnolls and hobgoblins and other undesirables, about to be shipped into the mines for slave labour. All our weapons and other equipment had been taken away and stored elsewhere, naturally. Along with the party and a few more guys, in our particular cell, there was also a single kobold. Of course, it was a kobold. It's like you can't have a game without one of these guys around anymore. He looked kind of bruised and beaten, but just sat there with an expressionless face even when an occasional hobgoblin thought it was funny to kick him. Wasn't much for conversation and seemed to ignore everyone else. Once the escape plan struck up and we managed to get out of the cell, though he too went straight to action, he followed the party to the wagon full of equipment. As they picked up their swords and spell books and other shit, he rummaged through until he found a rusty old dagger before turning around to help us against the oncoming enemy horde. While the party fighters and the dwarf with their big weapons drew most of their attention, he took the opportunity to flank stab them and managed to pull his own weight while still being much less useful than the PCs. And after the battle, when the rest of the captives spread out and fled into the night, the kobold followed the party for reasons none of them could understand. A side note, every enemy we killed was wearing a collar with a single glowing rune on it. The rune would fade away when its wearer died. The party wizard, myself, couldn't understand shit of them, especially since he didn't have an identify spell handy. Anyway, we headed east to avoid the main force of the villains, looking for clues of what they were all about, where they came from, and how to destroy them. The kobold would keep on hanging out with us, and we figured that since he was useful and didn't get in the way, might as well let him, since he didn't speak at all, even enough to say his name. So the fighter of the group just named him Obongo? Obongo, is that what that says? <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> Which he didn't seem to mind much either. <laughs> it was always a bit unclear if a bongo could understand us at all. Any questions, requests, orders or whatever were met with a short blank stare, after which he always went on doing his own thing, but sometimes it was the things we asked him to do, which made it ambiguous, regardless. It was always beneficial to the rest of the party. He could carry our things for us, take watches at night, cook for us surprisingly well, and of course, do all the thieving stuff. Whenever we had to break and enter, he had a lock pick ready, and I don't remember him ever failing to open the door for us. During dungeon crawls for magic artifacts and clues, he was in front to deal with the traps and stuff, something he also managed pretty well. Occasionally he'd disappear somewhere, only to turn up moments later when the party was ambushed, as an ogre fell down to its belly right when it was about to smash the wizard to mush, with a bongo standing behind it, a bloody dagger in hand. Once, a plot item was taken from us when a bunch of villains were waiting for us right outside the dungeon, leaving us with little choice but to hand it over. But as soon as they left, Obongo opened his palm and there it was, him having apparently nicked it from the nose pocket when his back was turned. One steel door on our way, barred, was open when the little kobold climbed up through a small window, disappeared into the building and moments later the door was opened with a few guards inside dead. Aside from these things, he leave the actual plot advancement stuff to the party, always remaining quiet and behind the grip as he discussed the plans of the villains and how these guys needed to die and so forth. It slowly became apparent that they were led by a powerful sorcerer and very possibly a lich and that we would have to learn everything we could of him before we would be ready to face him. Still, even though the group all had their personal agendas against the villains, their armies had burned down their hometowns after all. 
We were also getting rather more interested about this one kobold the DM had apparently pulled right out of his ass in the beginning of the game so that there was someone to deal with the traps and shit. The fact that he never spoke or did any sort of interaction whatsoever, that he had that blank expression on him at all times and that we had no bloody clue why he was even following us just made him all the more mysterious and intriguing. And then, after months of adventuring, gathering experience and power and interviewing powerful wizards and scholars about the villains, we finally thought ourselves to be ready and headed north, towards where the invasion had begun and that's when things started to get weird. We started to find more signs of warfare recently burned and pillaged city ruins, battlefields full of corpses and being gnawed on by crows, and so forth. There were also survivors and refugees who had told stories of how the enemy forces mercilessly destroyed everything in their path, burned what they couldn't loot, killed the children and others that couldn't work, and dragged the rest of their minds as sword fodder or other stuff like that. All the sort of shit that made so that the players could hate the big bad evil guy and it did work. The weird part started when one of the survivors told us a different story. He had been a guard in a castle where the general was found brutally murdered. There were an occasional bloodied corpse here and there. A maid had screamed about monsters just before she had died. And finally, when the enemy forces had arrived, the gates had been opened and the portcullis lowered, with men guarding them dead. The monsters had been just allowed in and he had only barely escaped with his life. He also told us how he had heard someone mention something about a creature in the shadows, small and vaguely reptilian, from whom he had only barely fled. Obongo was nowhere to be seen during this discussion. This really piqued our curiosity, so we asked any other survivors about similar tales and found out more stuff the sorts of a sneaky spy or whatnot showing up some days before the main army, crippling the defenders from within. An actual witness told us yes, it was unmistakably a kobold. This led us to finally conclude that Obongo had once worked with the enemy, though he obviously remained quiet and unreacting if we tried to ask him about the stuff. Apparently he had deserted at one point, which ended with us finding him from the same cell with us. Why he had done so remained unanswered. At this point it should be noted, for those unfamiliar with Advanced D&D 2nd Edition, the ones that do know this rule must have noticed this already, that I have pointed out him having used 6 of the 8 thieving skills, pickpockets, open locks, find traps, move silently and hide in shadows and climb walls, with a comfortable level of proficiency, something only a quite high level character could do. The rest of the party had started on first level, indicating that Obongo was in fact rather more experienced and competent than the rest of the group, even if he kept it to himself. Weirder still, we headed closer to the enemy strongholds. The witness reports started to change. There had been just one monster in the earlier stories, which had chronologically happened later. We were sort of hearing this in the backwards order, but now it changed to feature more than one, with someone witnessing a group of no less than three kobolds working in unison. Then the three was five, someone who witnessed one being killed by a lucky guard spear, which quickly turned into unluck when the remaining four descended upon him with daggers when the five was eight. During each story, as we got further to the source, the amount of kobolds increased, but their individual competence was similarly reduced. The single kobold in the first stories we had heard had been a terrifying creature lurking in the darkness, but in the later ones, when there had been more of them around, they seemed rather less so. Eventually, the number of kobolds crept into dozens, then hundreds, by this point they had been nothing but cannon fodder, the survivors telling the tale being actually pretty fond of fighting them when compared to something like a gnoll or an ogre at least. Kind of like an inverse ninja law or possibly alien aliens thingy or simply survival of the fittest with the large bunch of kobolds gradually being whittled down until only the toughest, most competent and the most badass were left and then continued to do so until even out of those only one remained and that was Obongo. These stories were the only thing that gave him any plot relevance or spotlight whatsoever, and though it may not sound like it, they were also relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. We'd hear bits and pieces of them amongst larger tales about dragon attacks and great war stories and how to deal with the lich or other shit. We also had a rather riveting discussion with an ancient gold dragon, one that wasn't able to actually strike against the enemy because she was busy guarding her own eggs. But she did tell us some things about the enemy, and especially the lich, and how to destroy him for good. His phylactery was a great magical orb that ate souls, which he used for some purpose even the dragon didn't know. 
but which could not be good at all. The reason he had everyone killed that could not be of use to him was so that he could keep feeding their souls to his phylactery. Indeed, even his own armies were not spared. Remember those collars I mentioned around the beginning of the story? If you don't, just rewind the video honestly. These were what were given to everyone working for him, whether in the army or in the mines, and as soon as they died it would trigger and their souls would fly all the way to the Lich's Tower and join all the other damned souls in his orb. Naturally, trying to desert or remove the collar ended with the same results. Obongo was alive though, and didn't have a collar. This was puzzling. At some points we even concluded that he was an enemy spy sent to gather information about us. I really want to say I'm a sad agent. Uh, no. <laughs> I really want to say that. A high-ranking enough henchman that he didn't even need a collar and his soul would be spared. It made us a bit doubtful of him for a while, but if he cared about all that, he naturally didn't show any signs of it. But for a short time as such, we suspected of Obongo as a spy or a traitor, but that ended in succession of two events. The first was when we had to rescue the king of the First Nation that had fallen to the enemy forces. He had been put down to the mines along with the rest of them, where he would dig up metals that would be used to forge swords. Unfortunately, upon finding him we discovered that he, along with all the other miners, was wearing one of those collars, and we had no idea how to remove it without resulting in the poor guy's death. Obongo stepped forward and fiddled with the thing for a while. He actually stopped at one point as if to show that this shit would be dangerous, but with the party and the king's consent, moved on. I was told later that what he did was to disarm a trap and pick a lock, both of them magical. Again, I needn't tell for anyone familiar with Advanced D&D 2nd Edition that all chances to deal with magical traps and locks are halved. He succeeded on both, albeit apparently with some difficulty, and the king was escorted out the back to his family and armies. The second event that led to his absolution was when we found his home, or what was left of it. A small worn of kobolds, enough to house perhaps a few hundred of them, but one that was now empty and dead. There was molten rock and ash everywhere, as if some great fire had burned through the tunnels, and we found many blackened skeletons, very small, huddled in one place. The bodies of adult kobolds were very few, indicating that they were dragged away to an unknown fate. Obongo's face was as blank as always. Even now he didn't speak a single word, but we could piece up what had happened pretty well. We all had decided that nope, this shit wouldn't stand. None of us had been particularly fond of kobolds before this campaign anyway. We continued on with a newfound determination. Ever since we had heard of the orb and the collars, we would started to kill the enemy only in self-defense, but we were pretty sure their souls would be freed upon the destruction of the phylactery anyway. After some more adventures and shenanigans, we finally made our way to the tower. Obongo disappeared over the wall and the doors were open for us and many guards were found dead. Many traps disarmed, but the kobold himself was nowhere to be seen. We could spot some small vents in the sorts, enough for him to move around, but not the rest of us. It's probably how he bypassed all the puzzles and riddles and other standard adventuring shit we had put up with. We finally reached the throne room and found the lich, as well as some of his trusted honour guard, Anna Bongo, lying on the ground, dead as a stone, with half the flesh burnt out from his bones. One standard evil speech and die monster debate which involved the kobolds only in passing and were more about the rest of the world and how he would rule it and no one will stop him etc. The battle was joined. The elite monsters were cut down or burned with magic, the blessings of the various good deities were called down and there was a pretty great magical duel between me and the lich. The usual stuff. Still, in the end, the battle could have gone better. The monsters were killed and the lich wounded, yes, but... Both the fighters and the dwarf were either dead or severely injured, and no one had even touched the orb that stood in the back of the room, glowing bright blue. Finally, only a grievously injured dwarf, half his beard had burned off and myself were left, along with the lich. His skull fractured and his robes torn, it was my turn, and I knew that I had to make my spell count. If I chose it well, I could maybe, possibly destroy him, after which we could go for the phylactery, but it was a gamble with the odds very much against me. But finally, I made my choice, a 5th level spell, one not very often used in our games, especially not like this in the middle of a battle. I had memorised it on whim, picked its components from the destroyed kobold village, Obongo would have severely disproved if he had known about it, and hadn't known if I would have needed it at all. I cast Animate Dead. Now, again for those that don't know about it, Animate Dead doesn't equal Rise Dead. It doesn't bring the deceased back to life, it basically just animates a bunch of corpses in the command of the wizard that casts it. 
slowly. The undead from a half-burned kobold rose up behind the lich, picking up the dagger he had used in his life and swaying a little bit as he began to walk. The DM told me that even though the spell should allow me to command the dead that I created, this one was not under my control. For reasons I could not understand, it had a mind of its own. But it did not matter, because what it did was what I would have commanded it to do anyway. Slowly it shambled towards the orb, and before the lich could do much else than yell a dramatic and much needed NO! Slowly and deliberately he plunged his dagger into the phylactery. There was an explosion of bright light and deafening sound of shattering glass. As the orb exploded all around us, pieces of crystal flying at us all over the rim. The undead forms of the lich and the kobold were disintegrated into nothing, and as the light faded enough that we could stare into the centre, we saw humanoid shapes. There were thousands of them, no, ten thousands of them, all races, whether human or demi-human or humanoid, most of them faded away rather quickly. A few shouted their thanks at us before they left. The ghost of the dwarf's wife had a heartfelt hug with her husband before she went too, but a few shades remained behind longer. Four of them were PCs, two fighters, the cleric and the bard that had fallen in the final battle, with the DM allowing each of them to say goodbye before they would move on. The last one, the final one to step forward to us, even though all the others had gone to the afterlife, was Obongo. He looked directly at my wizard. For the first time, I saw his blank expression fade away into a happy smile. And likewise, for the first time, I saw him open his mouth and heard him speak, even if it was just three words. Jurek thanks you. And then he was gone too, leaving behind two living and many, many dead. The lich was destroyed and the invasion was stopped and there was rebuilding to be done. All in all, it was rather bittersweet, but there was a strange warm feeling in my heart and I knew I would not shortly forget this. The DM didn't often use DM player characters and he admitted to us later that he had basically improvised most of this stuff up when the party, inexplicably to him, had ended up curious about the little kobold and what his deal was. I think he managed it fairly well, all considered. Indeed, when I look back, the rest of the adventure was rather standard and with its fair share of cliches, which I guess may be why I have forgotten many details about it. But this one DM player character I will remember. I played a kobold named Jurek some years later. Now, I have to say that is a very good way for a DM to actually have a player character and not actually in like you know interfere with the game you know like that story i did on sky discussion the other day where essentially it was just i want to show you my characters and you're just going to sit and watch fuck that i couldn't imagine anything worse but the way obongo was done was very good it really should be just to fit a little in and if you can make up like a bit of story like if you can tie them in in some way that's an excellent way to go about that um myself i am going in lost minds of fandelver with a few of my mates and I have got a dwarf clerk following them about and I've made him cousins with your dwarf was it Lockbiter or Lockseeker. So, you know, I've kind of tied them in a wee bit more. So I'm going to do a few things differently. But for the most part, he's just sitting there to sit and ca- he's just there to spam guidance and heal, you know, and that's all he's there for because the group doesn't have healer. And I want him there. It's most of the players. It's their first go. So I want to, like, you know, you know, give them a bit of an easier time. You know what I mean? But look, um, I've also got a bit of an announcement for you guys. So um, I know a lot of you guys are not happy we don't have text speech anymore. A lot of you guys are happy that we don't have text speech anymore. But for you guys that are saying, oh, what happened to the text speech? What's going on? Well, I'll show you. So I'll throw up on screen here. On the um, left hand side, we have the email that um, that, e- uh, that sorry YouTube sent me. How to mo- get monetized again. And it says here... Like, you know, if you read it, what I've underlined, the next step is to edit or delete any videos that violate our policies. I was like, right, okay. So I went to YouTube's Terms of Service and under the repetitious content, it says synthetic voice leads. Oh my God. Right. So I think it's definitely the text speech. What I'm really worried about is if the channel, if I have to delete or whatever, all my old videos, I really don't want to do that. So we'll just have to wait and see how things turn out. But I am working on an archive channel at the minute. All the videos are private. I'll let you guys know about that later down the line. If it does come to that, um, I really don't want it to come to that because, you know, I love a lot of the stories on this channel. I really do. And um, it'd be a shame to have to say goodbye to them. 
well, not exactly, because I'm going to be uploading them again on an archive channel, so look, don't worry about it too much. Um, but look, guys, as always, hope you guys enjoyed. I don't want to keep you for too long. Do remember, check out the guide from the other channel. It's still monetized and whatnot, so definitely check out some of the videos over there. And as always, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.